we're standing here in the middle of this amazing natural system. We've got climate change impacting these animals. You talk to anyone that's out there producing your food, shellfish farmers or the fishermen, they're at the forefront of that changing climate. Here we are on the shores of the ocean, the, the Delaware Bay. Every year, these horseshoe crabs come all the way up the bay. They want to lay their nests here in these, this kind of nice sand. <laughs> yeah, so they're very closely related to spiders. They've existed on this planet for over 400 million years doing this. This is reproduction in action, right? And this really only happens in the Delaware Bay on this scale. Um, horseshoe crabs will spawn in other places in the world, but not in these kind of numbers. These boys are so eager to fertilize eggs, they think my boot is a female crab. <laughs> Hi there, pal. They're also really important for the biomedical industry. They have this really unique blue colored blood that's very, very reactive to bacteria, so much so that they can use it to detect bacteria in injectable drugs. So if you've had your COVID vaccination, for example, it was tested um, and proven to be clean of bacteria based on a test that uses this guy's blood. They're producing all this excess eggs that get shared with the wider ecosystem. The birds can now feed on some of the eggs and the fish and the turtles, they're waiting to feed. This is a great example here of the eggs. The migratory shorebirds come through in the spring knowing that this activity will be happening. And so the birds are all here waiting for the table to be set for their breakfast, their dinner. It's nighttime. <laughs> This beach is messy, it's muddy, it's full of snails, there's shells yeah. and seaweed, but that's what makes it so cool. New Jersey Audubon, it's its own statewide nonprofit environmental organization. You know, with the birds, really the primary driver of migration um, is, is resources. Red knots, for instance, are relying on these horseshoe crab eggs. They'll migrate from the tip of southern Argentina all the way up to the Arctic circle literally from one end of the earth to the other end and you know they are in trouble it's on the yellow watch list for declining species the IUCN red list lists red knots as a near threatened species in our classroom we've got a picture of red knots on the wall and I always liked posing the question to the kids so what can we do to help save this threatened species of course, this place is really ecologically important for the crabs and the birds. It's also a really, really important oyster farming area. The Delaware Bay is this ideal shellfish habitat. Really wide expanse of very flat, sandy bottom that's just packed full of shellfish. Oyster farms themselves provide a number of ecosystem services. They help stabilize the shoreline. They help provide also habitat for various fish species. Generally, shellfish farms are very sustainable in terms of protein production. They're one of the greenest ways that we can produce protein for human consumption. Follow me. This should be the least horseshoe crab way. They look like rocks, but they're creatures. In the 20s, Cape May was one of the oyster capitals of the world. And this place was sending out 80 boxcar loads of oysters a day. Common people ate a lot of oysters. It was a big source of nutrition. What's nice about it is no fertilizer, no pesticide. We don't have to buy food because they eat out of the bay. You know, the algae, whatever's here, they eat it. And we make a healthy food, which is lovely. They filter what's in the water and then clean the water. The questions our research team has been working on for the past few years is really about whether or not having these farms out there between the ocean and where they want to spawn, whether those farms were having any kind of impact on the ability of these crabs to get here and to lay their nests. 
The concerns had to do with, would something like a horseshoe crab be able to maneuver under these racks that are kind of very low lying? You know, with the red knots, it's almost hard to imagine that their populations could, you know, plummet. But without those eggs, I mean, they certainly could. Yeah. These two systems, they're both really important and we want to find ways to make sure that they can both thrive together. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to understand the day-to-day -day of what I do. It's a very unusual job. My grandfather, what he tells his friends is that his granddaughter is a clam doctor that makes the clams have sex. <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. I do a little bit more than that, but <laughs> that's a good summary. I grew up in the mountains in Canada. I'm the first in my family to go to university, first to go to post-grad. I come from a bit of a different family background, really blue-collar roots more in my family. I really value what I'm seeing out here, people working hard to make a living, and how we need to consider the resources we rely on and don't take those for granted. As a scientist, I want to address and, and contribute to sustainable, continued food production, but also protection of these important species. Shellfish, they're such a cool critter. It's such an incredible source of protein and can do so much for people, but also do so much for the ecosystem. It's become um, my passion. Tonight, once the tide goes out, we're gonna be out here on the flats taking samples of these horseshoe crab eggs. And what we wanna ultimately look at is the distribution or where these horseshoe crab eggs are in relation to the, the oyster farms that are out there. Okay, so I'm one, you're two, you're three, you're four, five, six. Hi. We're collecting sediment core samples and then we're gonna count the number of horseshoe crab eggs. And we're just trying to get a sense of how they're distributed in relation to oyster farms. So we're gonna get these samples up here that are on the beach and then we're gonna do it all over again on the other side of the farm. We're gonna sample this control here and then the farm is next. I'm trying to get all the small grains of sand out and so it just leaves behind everything bigger than one millimeter, like a horseshoe crab egg. Sometimes there's like 40,000, so they can take me a few hours. So here are some horseshoe crab eggs from this sample that we collected on the beach. Since the eggs and the sand grains are similar in size, I have to sort through them all together, which makes counting very slow. As I see a horseshoe crab egg, I count it on the clicker counter. On a typical day, I could count as many as 10,000 horseshoe crab eggs. We did a lot of experiments looking at how horseshoe crab behavior might change. The question seemed pretty straightforward at first, right? Can the crabs walk under or over or around oyster gear to access their spawning sites? And we started with behavior observations. We took crabs and we put them around oyster gear and we literally just watched what they would do. We also did that in these tanks here where we would number the crabs and watch them over the course of five or 10 minutes walking around oyster gear. The very next season, we let the natural system be our setup instead of a tank. And so what we decided to do was use sonar, underwater sound, to see the crabs. And it turns out you can see them really well. When they're on land, they seem kind of awkward and they, they move fairly slowly, but once they get into the water, they can swim really well, like gone. We were working 24 hours a day. And over the course of about three weeks, I was able to sleep, you know, two to four hours every, every 24 hours. Um, you know, as I, as I could. And so what I did is I actually set up a tent here and I, I lived in a tent for that period of time so that I could at least catnap when, when we could. We started this program probably, what, six years ago? We've spent 70 or so nights out on the flats collecting the samples. Some nights it would be like 
9 p.m. to 3 a.m., you're kind of nocturnal. Yeah. It's thousands of hours on the beach collecting it, thousands of hours in the lab. You're going to count how many eggs are there. And that's going to be one data point that goes into a huge data table yeah. that's going to get summarized into one average count. Between staff and students and volunteers, it's literally hundreds of people. What makes me feel comfortable and confident in our data is that any way we did it, whether we were taking the samples like yours, or we're watching the behavior using tanks, or we're using sonar and video, all gave us the same answer, right? For all these samples we collected over the past two years, we're finding similar numbers of horseshoe crab eggs on the beach in areas with oyster farms and areas without oyster farms. The eggs are distributed completely evenly across the beach and the red knots are able to access that food. And also the horseshoe crabs are easily able to migrate through the farms to access the beach. They can really kind of crawl around and over anything that's out there. They're really hard to <laughs> keep from, from getting through things. In fact, there's pretty great coexistence. The conservation organizations that might be concerned about the bird species and the horseshoe crab population needs to be having these open conversations with the researchers. Let's look at the science, look at the data. Well, what I can tell you is that the horseshoe crabs, especially in hot weather, love to hang out under here. They do seem to seek it out. And I think they like the shade. Maybe they feel protected. But also, you were pointing out, oysters, when they're filtering water, they're creating little packages <laughs> of poop. Plenty of food for things like horseshoe crabs. The farm itself is creating a microhabitat. I think it's really satisfying. Your science has value besides just being published in a paper. When that product informs decisions, like oyster farm management or like shorebird management, I find that to be really fulfilling. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for two years, oyster farmers met with conservationists. We arm wrestled over it. One of the things we said, we have to have racks high enough that the crabs can go under. We can't work weekends, so nobody's out here. They have birds get free weekends on the flats. <laughs> nobody's here. <laughs> and then the rack height, if any of the racks end up pushed into the bottom, you've got to go around and, and lift them out of the bottom. Yes, exactly. Yeah, to exactly. Make sure there's but I made all these bright and shiny new racks that are plenty high. But that's a lot of time, right? That's a lot of labor. Yes. But it's okay. I mean, I am happy to do it because I know it's the right thing to do. When it comes to conservation, it has to be a collaborative effort. The oyster farmers are coming up with a way to bring back the oyster industry that was here for generations. We have to listen to each other. Changes due to climate change are happening faster and faster and we need to understand how these animals respond, how our food production systems respond, um, and how we can help to mitigate some of the, the the problems that might come. The ocean is essential to life on our planet. There's absolutely no way for us to take ourselves out of the system. We are dependent on this being a healthy relationship.